biggest fear is that we'll not figure out the answers in time. The uncertainty that we live with is enormously challenging. The world has a lot of problems. And fortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs to try to solve them. The 5,000 people are coming from different countries, from different walks of life. That is the beginning of the change that we need. what is driving our innovation. Human beings are built for resilience and creativity often emerges in times of great struggle. We have to be able to dream of a future if we're gonna be able to walk into it together. I think we're bored. Bored of perfect, polished, pretty. I would much rather see chaotic energy. Great ideas can come from anywhere. I'm someone I never give up. Resilience is the word. What problems there are that you can solve yourself. We're developing not just the technology, but also the people around it and our organization, our understanding of how to work together. You have to nurture a relationship for it to be successful. And the best way to change that is not from the outside. Be part of the dream. Follow your passion, make the impossible possible. You have the power to determine the direction in which this world moves. If we can do it, everybody else can do it. Let's do it together. there's no question, is going from 2D to 3D. It's happening all around us. I don't think you could replace me with AI and do the same YouTube videos. It's all about people. When you have a shared vision, it is incredible what you can accomplish. The people in this room, the jobs that you create, allow us to have vibrant and dynamic communities. And we get to have some fun over the course of that process as well. transformative force. You have unique opportunities to build something great. And we can be found on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. And that's really where we need to start flipping the script and thinking about things differently. Creative people and creativity is about what could be and should be. And I think it's really up to you guys. We're in love with the region. Like, there's so many possibilities here. The world needs more of that now than ever. Let's go get it. Let's do it. Because it can be done.
My biggest fear is that we'll not figure out the answers in time. The uncertainty that we live with is enormously challenging. The world has a lot of problems. And fortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs to try to solve them. The 5,000 people are coming from different countries, from different walks of life. That is the beginning of the change that we need. what is driving our innovation. Human beings are built for resilience and creativity often emerges in times of great struggle. We have to be able to dream of a future if we're gonna be able to walk into it together. I think we're bored. Bored of perfect, polished, pretty. I would much rather see chaotic energy. Great ideas can come from anywhere. I'm someone I never give up. Resilience is the word. What problems there are that you can solve yourself. We're developing not just the technology, but also the people around it and our organization and our understanding of how to work together. You have to nurture a relationship for it to be successful. And the best way to change that is not from the outside. Be part of the dream. Follow your passion, make the impossible possible. You have the power to determine the direction in which this world moves. If we can do it, everybody else can do it. Let's do it together. there's no question, is going from 2D to 3D. It's happening all around us. I don't think you could replace me with AI and do the same YouTube videos. It's all about people. When you have a shared vision, it is incredible what you can accomplish. The people in this room, the jobs that you create, allow us to have vibrant and dynamic communities. And we get to have some fun over the course of that process as well. transformative force. You have unique opportunities to build something great. And we can be found on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. And that's really where we need to start flipping the script and thinking about things differently. Creative people and creativity is about what could be and should be. And I think it's really up to you guys. We're in love with the region. Like, there's so many possibilities here. The world needs more of that now than ever. Let's go get it. Let's do it. Because it can be done.
biggest fear is that we'll not figure out the answers in time. The uncertainty that we live with is enormously challenging. The world has a lot of problems. And fortunately, a lot of entrepreneurs to try to solve them. The 5,000 people are coming from different countries, from different walks of life. That is the beginning of the change that we need. what is driving our innovation. Human beings are built for resilience and creativity often emerges in times of great struggle. We have to be able to dream of a future if we're gonna be able to walk into it together. I think we're bored. Bored of perfect, polished, pretty. I would much rather see chaotic energy. Great ideas can come from anywhere. I'm someone I never give up. Resilience is the word. What problems there are that you can solve yourself. We're developing not just the technology, but also the people around it and our organization and our understanding of how to work together. You have to nurture a relationship for it to be successful. And the best way to change that is not from the outside. Be part of the dream. Follow your passion, make it. Please welcome to the stage, CEO of Web Summit, Catherine Marr. Welcome. You are all very welcome to Web Summit 2023 here in the glorious city of Lisbon. My name is Catherine Marr, and I'm the new CEO of Web Summit. This is actually not my first time on this stage. I was here in 2019, astonished at the size of the crowd. You're the reason that we're here. It was up here on this stage that I was really able to start to see Web Summit's impact and be inspired by Web Summit's mission to connect people and ideas that change the world. And as I stand here again, I can see even more clearly how technology contains all of our collective wishes for a better and brighter future. In this moment, technology may be both our greatest hope for progress and also our greatest potential divider. Because of this, I believe that Web Summit's role as a place for connection and community 
is more urgent than ever. It is the only event where tens of thousands of us meet to tackle these issues through the technology that you build, the companies that you found, and the ideas that you champion. I may not be new to this stage, but I am new to this role. Many of you know that I started as CEO just two weeks ago after Web Summit's founder and former CEO, Patty Cosgrove, resigned. And I want to take a minute just to address what happened. We owe that to everyone here because you came out for this event, because you love Web Summit, and this community matters to you. And we also owe it to everyone who decided not to come because even though they are not here, it's because you feel strongly enough about Web Summit that what we say and what we do matters. If you know Patty, you know that he's always been outspoken on stage and online. And about a month ago, Patty tweeted about the conflict between Israel and Hamas. Patty will be the first to admit that his tweets were divisive and that they hurt people, including people who consider themselves part of this community. He's since apologized and stepped down. I think it's important to say that I believe that everyone everywhere has the right to express their views about any topic, including what's happening in the world. This is true whether those views are wise Thank you. This is true whether those views are wise and well-considered or disposable and disappear in the doom scroll. We all know what that's like. If we didn't have that right to free expression or that right to debate, our Web Summit stages would be empty of ideas, challenge and change. We expect plenty of debate on these stages in the days to come. But I also want to acknowledge that having a right to free expression and considering the weight of your words are two very different things. So, as the new CEO, I have two things that I want to make clear. The first is to reaffirm that right to ideas and expression. Web Summit is a place where you should come to be challenged and prepare to challenge in return. There are too many important conversations that we need to have as a technology community and society, and Web Summit will not shy away from hosting them. But I do ask that you do this respectfully. I want you to see and uphold your, each other's humanity, even in our hardest conversations. It's just that we recognize that technology and our collective well-being on everything from the future of artificial intelligence to the future of our habitable planet requires that disruptors and innovators are willing to ask difficult questions and challenge the status quo. The second thing that I want to say is that Web Summit's mission is to be the space for these conversations, hopefully not the subject of them. Over the last decade, as Web Summit has grown, we've brought together tens of thousands of people who have used this week in Lisbon as a springboard to do remarkable things, to launch companies, find investors, unveil projects, and advance a vision of this world that is worth debating. So since joining, I've been asked what the future of Web Summit will be. And I can tell you tonight that as the new leader of this organization, we have incredibly committed people, an incredibly dedicated community, and personally, as a longtime advocate of technology as a driving force for the good of humanity and society, that Web Summit will continue to be the most important place to bring people together, connect you, and advance these essential conversations about technology, society, and innovation. We can confidently fulfill this mission because of you, <laughs> because you are the incredible people, the founders, the companies, the contributors who fill our stages with new ideas, our heads with fresh perspectives, and our hearts with the promise of progress. So 2023 has been a year of huge lows and tremendous highs and accelerating change, right? Technology continues to turn every single thing that we thought we knew about the world, our place in society, the future of work, politics, and life itself on our planet upside down. And at the same time, 
I find myself genuinely awed by the technological advances that will continue to propel us forward. We're seeing this tantalizing promise of fusion and new forms of energy, carbon capture technology's potential to reverse the very real impacts of climate change. And on our stages in the coming days, there will be hundreds of talks and conversations about how AI technologies can be used to create access to education, personalized healthcare, humanitarian aid, and drive us towards a more connected, prosperous, and sustainable future. There will also be robust debates about the peril of AI and how we might think about serving a humanity rather than serving technology. Shortly, you're going to hear from a friend of mine, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia. You may have heard of it. Wiki Jimmy is going to talk about the future of AI and human knowledge, which is a subject that's incredibly close to my heart. But he's just the start. We have 70,000 attendees coming over the course of the next few days to hear hundreds of speakers across this program. There are more than 2,600 startups. 900 investors, and 300 technology company partners coming this week. We have a packed program of talks and roundtables and mentor sessions. And then we've got everybody's favorite, Night Summit, where you can go and have a drink and a snack and soak up Lisbon, this beautiful Lisbon, this incredible weather, and meet your next co-founder, investor, creative partner, or best friend. So having said that, I want to continue what has become a tradition here at Web Summit. I'm going to ask you all to stand up. Come on, stand up, stretch out. Come on, let's do this. Everybody up, let's go. And I am going to join you as we turn around and introduce ourselves to th at least three people next to us. All right, I want you to get going. I'm coming to meet my three new best friends. Hello. I'm Catherine Marr. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My name is Sara Kamadi. Sara, nice to meet you. Where are you in from? I'm from Qatar. Qatar. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hi. Shimena, hi. How are you doing? Uh, nice to meet you. Where are you in from? Chile. Where's that? Sorry? From Chile. From Chile. Oh, I love Chile. It's wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Rodrigo. Where are you from? Brazil. Brazil. Oh, I'm going to call on you to call out yourself very loudly in a minute. All right, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, I see it's begun. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you've met somebody. All right, all right, settle down, settle down. <laughs> so for me, that's the joy of Web Summit, OK? That's what I want you doing in every session you sit in, at every food stand you stand in line in. I want you to keep that spirit of connection coming because you never quite know who you're going to meet and what it is that you're going to accomplish together. You don't yet know how what happens tonight might be the thing that sets you off in a different direction, a transformation of your company, your career, your purpose, your country, the world. Speaking of, there are attendees here from all four corners of the world. So I know the answer to this because I just met someone from there. Who's here from Brazil? Woo! Make some noise. Who's here from Nigeria? A little louder, a little louder. Anyone from India? Happy Diwali. Anyone's first time? <laughs> kind of mine, too. OK, great. Um, Portugal. Let's hear it for our wonderful host from Portugal, from Lisbon, this incredible, magnificent city. Yeah. 
So speaking of Portugal, I'd like to introduce our host for the rest of the night, Filomena Cautela. Filomena is going to take us through the next part of the evening. She's going to be out in a moment. I'll be back in a little bit. I look forward to continuing with you all. Filomena. Yes! <laughs> Catherine, everyone, a huge round of applause for our new CEO. It's such a pleasure to meet you, Catherine. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is it. Welcome to opening night. I know you already screamed today, but let's hear it. Make some noise, Web Summit. Come on. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Catherine just spoke out. There's people from all over the world here. A lot of first timers. I didn't know there were a lot of first timers here. Yeah, that was a surprise, wasn't it? Okay. So, just for one time, will the Portuguese people make some noise so I can hear them? Where's Portuguese people? Okay. Yes, we like to whistle, right? <laughs> Got it. Okay. So, my name is Filomena Cautela. I'm a Portuguese host, and I will be your host this evening um, for this so anticipated opening night. I'm really, really happy. I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Uh, of course, this is my home country. Uh, and this is Web Summit, the largest technology conference in Europe. So this is big. We have just heard from the amazing new CEO. Let's give it up one more time to Catherine Meyer, everyone, the new CEO of Web Summit. Yes. Come on. I, I, I just thought I, I should have brought a dress, right? Just a little coat, and Catherine just came here and pa pow destroyed. She did. So up next, we have uh, some of Portugal's top tech founders. We have the founder of Wikipedia here tonight. Yes, you heard me right. As well as the mayor of Lisbon and the minister of economy. We have lots to get through. So let's get started right now with the biggest, the biggest subject uh, in tech at the moment. Of course, we are talking about artificial intelligence. Our two speakers for this talk are two of Portugal's top technology founders. We're going to start with Cristina Fonseca. Cristina is one of the founders of TalkDesk, a cloud-based help desk software that became Portugal's third unicorn after raising $100 million in Series B funding at a valuation of over $1 billion in 2021. Pretty cool. Since then, Christina has, became, has become a venture partner and Indico Capital Partners, the first Portuguese private venture capital fund investing in Portugal and Spain, early stage tech-focused startups. Okay, we have Christina. We also have Vasco Pedro. Vasco is the CEO of Unbabel, an artificial intelligence-powered human translation platform. Cool. The company has headquarters here in Lisbon, Portugal, and San Francisco, California. So tonight, Cristina and Vasco will be speaking to Nilza Rodrigues from Forbes Portugal. I actually love her. And they will discuss the impact of the Portuguese tech industry, um, w w what the impact of the Portuguese industry will have in AI. So please join me on a big round of applause for Cristina Fonseca, Vasco Pedro, and Nilza Rodrigues. Come on. AI, a transformative force shaping our world, revolutionizing our lives, solving challenges, safer roads, self-driving cars, simplifying tasks, answering questions, a catalyst for progress. The power of AI. Wow, such a crowd. <laughs> Damn, a lot of people. <laughs> so, Hello, Christina and Vasco, um, let's have a real talk about artificial intelligence. No chatbots allowed here in this conversation, okay? Um, did you know that um, a recent study by Eurostat put, uh, ranks Portugal in second in adoption of artificial intelligence technology? 
Isn't that amazing? What do, you, what do you think, Christina, for instance? What are your thoughts about it? So, uh, first of all, hello, everyone. Great pleasure to be here. I learned that in the backstage. I should not be surprised, but I am. Although, like, it's quite easy to justify. Portugal is a very entrepreneurial ecosystem. If we think about the biggest success cases in terms of startups, most of them are AI native companies, and this is before AI was cool. So when we think about and Bebel, Feedseye, Sword Health, these companies were founded in like maybe 2015, uh, like 10 years ago, and they're already AI first. Um, Portugal is very strong on the B2B, and I think most of the startups that succeeded have been leveraging data and AI to like, really impact customers and build products that drive real value. I think also when we, when we think about like, like what's needed for companies to, to adopt AI, we need a mix of innovators, and the startups are a very good example of that. We need uh, talent, and we need corporates and the, the corporate sector to adopt these technologies. Um, and in Portugal, these intervenients of the ecosystem really work well together. And they take risks, and they are entrepreneurial. So for example, me and Vasco, we are on the board of a consortium uh, that we call a responsible AI consortium uh, that uh, gathers research institutes, startups, and corporates to solve big problems with AI, design the right framework, and make sure AI is adopted responsibly. So I think this is a very good example of um, like the fact that we are ahead in terms of AI adoption. It's and great I, for if, us. If I could add, I just I think it's also part of our DNA, right? I mean, Portugal was the first country to have 100% mobile adoption, you know, in Europe, yeah. um, and we've always been early adopters of things. I think people get excited about new, uh, and we don't strange it very much. You know, I feel like the, the, the rise from what's ChatGPT to like, oh yeah, that's cool, I'm going to try it, felt incredibly fast in Portugal, right? And I think we, we have that openness towards technology that is potentially well represented in Web Summit. Yes, Vasco, you, f you founded uh, Unbabel 10 years ago. Uh, yep. You did predict this boom, didn't you? Yeah. You, you knew this was the way. Yeah, we, when we started in Babel, it was exactly because we were seeing that we were early stages of AI, but AI was about to create massive disruptions in a number of industries, including the translation industry, which is where we are. Okay, and uh, the pandemic was a jackpot to the tech companies. Did you feel that? I think there were COVID winners, COVID losers. I think for Embel, we're COVID in-betweeners. <laughs> you know, like, definitely can name some examples that benefited from the massive change and acceleration of digital transformation that the pandemic uh, created as opportunities. Other companies didn't quite make it so well, but overall, I think the, the, the technology companies got a shot at suddenly becoming more relevant in a lot okay. of use cases. And I think we're seeing a lot of the benefits uh, right now. Okay, Christina, I, I use the word boom. Maybe it is a boom in a bubble. How do you bring the community to this when we have that big shadow that uh, AI will uh, take over our jobs? Uh, the AI taking over Ooh. our jobs is always like a, a very good question to ask. Look, I think as we've seen in previous revolutions, AI will automate a lot of the work that we do today, and we should accept that. Um, I think there's industries where like, that's a little bit more obvious. And I believe the challenging part is if you've, have, if you've had a career for 30 years, like, it's very hard to accept that a new technology will do a better job than you do. Okay. But there's uh, other industries, and I think like call centers and customer service are just a very good example where no one makes a career in like, being a customer service agent. Uh, and if the in work Portugal. is in Portugal. If you're in the Philippines, you do. <laughs> Probably, like, you're right. But, but I think like, uh, uh, there's just work that's too manual and can absolutely be done by a machine way better than a human. And humans can level up, do a different thing. Um, like, so I believe the transition will be difficult. But as new people enter the job market, in the next couple of years, we will all learn to do our jobs with an assistant or multiple assistants by our side that will help us be better at what we do, uh, be way more productive. Um, so I think like the transition will be tough, 
But in the end, like in a couple of years, no one will talk about AI as this thing. It's just going to be embedded everywhere. So w one expression that I heard recently that I think applies here is this sense of that AI is a cognitive prosthetic. Uh, in the same, you know, it was Fran Pereira from Google that, that, that said it, and I thought it was brilliant. Because what we're seeing, and we're seeing in translation, we're going to see in a bunch of areas, is that if you've invested 30 years in being an expert, uh, using something like ChatGPT, you'll still have some gain, but maybe not quite as much because you think, hey, I already know how to do my job really well. I'm not going to change my ways. Mm -hmm. But if you're just starting out, if you're kind of like not at the top of the expert pyramid, you benefit massively. So what you have is an upskill of beginners into experts very quickly, yeah. right? And so this idea of having augmented cognition because of AI is going to be something that we're going to see more and more into every area that we do. And Can one more data point on this that I think is interesting is in every, every technological revolution in the past, there's never been a case where the increase in GDP did not lead to more jobs. And so how, what are those jobs is hard to say, but there is no reason to think this one will be different. right? I think we are about to create much more wealth, and that tends to lead to more jobs even though they're different. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, and I think like a very good point is, let's say if you're you're a new doctor, like you will want AI to help you learn faster, be better at yeah. your job, become an expert from day one. Exactly, a being an expert for day one is such a like a huge benefit of like everyone entering the job market that in like 10, yeah, 15 you years, know how, how it's people just always be say the that there is. Uh, in every job profession, there's like 10% of experts, you know, the, the best doctors or coders, right? The best coders and the worst coders, like 10x difference. The same applies to doctors and every other profession. Imagine if everyone is an expert, everyone is on the top 10%, right? What would be the benefit of society if you, everyone had access to the best doctor ever, right? Yes. Uh, do you think um, regulation will help people trust in uh, AI? Where do you stand for? I think it's important to make the effort to try to regulate and to have deep thinking and discussion around it. I think Europe was, has been working on AI regulation for a number of years. It's been a bit upended with uh, ChatGPT and, and generative AI because it, it's such a different uh, type of, of, of AI. I think the challenge is that political systems are biological in nature and they're slow to regulate and AI is evolving at a very fast pace. I mean, every three months, OpenAI releases something new that completely disrupts the ecosystem again. So it's hard to regulate something that is evolving that fast. Uh, and I think that will be a challenge. OK. So Christina, let's talk about investments. It was an invested year for you in AI startups? Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you, when you asked me about investments, and at Indico, uh, we did eight new investments this year. We are formalizing three more, so we've been quite active. Maybe two companies are uh, more AI focused, and that's Data for Deals um, and Nortech. But when a company comes to me and starts by pitching me the technology, like I get skeptical because I believe AI is a very, very powerful tool that's here to help us solve big problems. But the big problems that are worth solving with this technology were here like before. So. I love when founders come to me and like pitch me hard problems to solve. I believe the technology is a tool. Of course, now with AI and especially these large language models, uh, <clears throat> we can solve the same problems in like innovative ways, and that's amazing. I'm an engineer, big fan of tech, but please pitch me problems, not solutions, and not AI. Maybe can segue <laughs> as an example. So we uh, at Amel have been developing something that we're presenting tomorrow here at Center Stage at two. And it came from a problem, right? So this idea of there's a lot of situations when you want to communicate without speaking. And if you look at you know, situations of like patients like ALS, which they're locked in, like Stephen Hawking, uh, the technology right now is just not adequate to enable communication. And so we used large language model coupled with a non-invasive neural interface to create a new device for people to communicate using thought which patients are already using it now, right? And we're going to demo this live tomorrow at 2, so you're all invited to come and watch. Uh, you know, it's a bit the future of this area of, of AI wearables, but it, it starts with a problem. Like, okay, how do we improve the lives of these people? And here's a situation where an LLM can really make a difference. Vasco, that, that's huge. That's, I believe, the, the real purpose of the AI, is doing such things. Tomorrow you will hear Vasco, but uh, it's huge. Yeah, I think... What I'm seeing is, this isn't a trend, so I, I started coding when I was six. I'm a big fan of sci-fi. I've been dreaming about 
the, the stage that we're living forever, right? And yes. I've been thinking that w the way I'm seeing cognition evolve is that we're kind of in the beginning of a hybrid model of human augmentation through AI. This is the first example. So ultimately, we want to enable everyone to be augmented by AI in different ways. But focusing on problems you can solve right now that have impact in real life of real people, I think is key to making a difference and to drive towards something that is positive and good. OK. So um, Unbevel is rising. Um, you, you focus on um, the power of language, on, on, on translation. Uh, many people doesn't know that only 25% of the world speaks English. And what about of the other 75%? How do you connect them? Yeah, I think... Thinking globally. Our, our mission is, was, is very simple. We want to make it easy for every company to operate in multiple languages. And we see this because every company that scale, every startup here that will scale, will need to suddenly serve whatever they do to new customers in new languages. So how do I market? How do I sell? How do I have my website? How do I do customer support? And in a lot of this, we're now seeing that AI will have a bigger and bigger impact, and we'll be able to automate part of it. But what we're seeing in, when, it, when it comes to language is that the nuances are so important that you have a wide spectrum of use cases. For some, AI will, is the solution. Others, you need a hybrid model. Others, you need humans to be there with the nuance and transcreation and curation and creativity. And it's being able to create a platform that makes all this process seamless is what we're doing. And so um, we're, even though we've been around for 10 years, we're just beginning. Language is such a big thing. You, know, you can think of language in a way as the OS of society. You know, it's how we communicate, it's how we think. Uh, and we tend to be very focused on our bubble of language, of who we can interact with, and the markets that we're in. And so if we can truly connect the entire world and make language not an issue, there is no limit to the amazing things we can do. Christina, how do we connect with the undeveloped countries? I mean, uh, Africa is the continent of the future. Is there a, a future without AI? Again, like I see AI as a tool, and I believe, um, like especially right now, like uh, my favorite thing about ChatGPT was not the technology itself. Like large language models have been around for a while. Companies like Unbabel and, and others have been using them, uh, but the change management trends that it created. Because suddenly, um, to set up to properly implement AI within a company, two years ago, it would require a huge investment lots of months trying to understand where do I have the data, train a model, uh, know what good looks like. Like It would be a, a huge project in terms of like time and money. And with ChatGPT, people saw the power of AI instantly. So now everyone is like, I see the potential. Give me this thing in my business. So to me, the change management aspect was uh, uh, um, very interesting to see. And because of that, I think for the first time, countries, continents, companies realize it's, this is the time to invest in AI. So I believe, of course, we'll have to drive that investment in order to, um, of course, like we need to develop better models, but there's lots and lots of companies developing very powerful models that we can apply almost off the shelf. It's not as easy as that. Um, so I would say that's number one, investments and keep integrating these tools. The second thing is building trust. We understand the potential, but probably one of Vasco's biggest challenges is how do people, do people trust AI to do what humans used to do for the past decades? Um, and maybe we need to do it step by step. So first of all, the AI like starts doing a manual job or being a co-pilot to the human, and the human is still a supervisor until people build trust in, in AI and they are ready for, for, for the transition. So like, I believe that's where the biggest challenge is. I have no doubt in the next decade, we, we are not going to talk about AI in an explicit way, but every single piece of software companies will buy will have to have intelligence embedded. When we think about applications like Spotify or YouTube that have a lot of AI embedded already, and recommendation algorithms and know our preferences, if we go back to the old way of interacting with consumer software that doesn't understand who I am, I'm not going to be happy. Like, try to give like, YouTube to my kids without the recommendations is like, no, this is not what I want. So 
this is going to happen in enterprise software as well. Every piece of software that's going to be developed in the next decades will have to have intelligence embedded. Yeah, and to your point, humans are weird when it comes to trust, right? We start by not trusting. We tend to be skeptics. Evolutionary makes sense. But as soon as you see two or three examples, we're like, yeah, this works. We're like, well, then we generalize it. Like, if it works for this, it works for everything, right? And then we rely on later on, if there is a mistake, is when we go back and then start the process again. So I think that will happen faster than we think it will. Yeah. OK, that's a good call to action. Um, last question for both of you. What inspires you to go on, Vasco? I think we are really in the beginning of what I think is the next stage of human evolution. And I think what we're seeing systems of AI and the hybrid models that we're seeing, the combination of biological and technology, are going to radically change the face of the world. And I'm very excited to be part of that. OK, Christina? Very deep question. <laughs> so I think what inspires me is having people get together to solve deep problems and collaborate towards like a common goal. So super inspired to be here, for example. I think this is a great crowd, and I'm super excited with the next couple of days. OK, I will leave also an inspiration quote, just a reminder for all of us from Steve Harris. And he says, the real danger is not that computers will begin to think like men, but that men will begin to think like computers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina and Vasco. <laughs>
Someone is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to get an all-access pass to the entire event. So this is serious, guys. Someone is getting a golden ticket right now. Yes. Actually, <laughs> no, it's not by screaming, but that will be cool as well. But it's not by screaming. That's an idea for next year, maybe. So two people will get this opportunity. So attention, everyone. Attention to all the arena. Right now, will everyone get naked? It's not, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're gonna kill me backstage. It's not. That would be funny as well, but no. Will everyone here at the arena look under your chair right now and see if you are sitting on top of this amazing Web Summit experience upgrade? Look under your chair, we will find out if you have a golden ticket. Who has it? I know Casey is in the audience, our co-host from Web Summit. Casey, are you there? I am here, Philomena. Okay. All right, everybody. How's it going? I'm here. Don't worry, I'm here. Yeah. All right, so we're looking in the audience. Who has the golden ticket? Everybody on it? this side? No? No Who's one has the, it? Oh, there, I see the guy. He's on the, he's on the big screen there. Oh, Great. we have a okay. winner. We have a winner. All the cameras are on already. Sorry. Okay, can you, uh, the guy with the golden ticket, can you come out to the uh, front here? A round of applause for Mohammed! Yes, for Mohammed! A scholar. Interesting. Congratulations. All right. Sorry, you're not, it's not that easy, though, to get the ticket. You've got to do something to win it. So, as Philomena said, you know, it's the big tech conference, the VIPs, big, big people back there. So I want to make sure that you are tech savvy enough to be back there with everybody. Okay? So I'm going to ask you three questions. If you have to get them right, and then we'll let you backstage. Okay, you ready? Oh, he's going to answer the questions. Good. All right. The first question is, what does AI stand for? Oh, come on. Artificial intelligence. All right. He got the first one right. Are you kidding right. me? Round of applause. Yeah, amazing, amazing. All right. Come on. Okay. All right. The second one's a little harder. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know Mohammed's uh, skill set level here. So, all right. So then second question is, Elon Musk bought Twitter last year, okay. and he renamed it to this new company name this year, what is the answer? X. Is he right? Come on, All this right. is not great. fair! All right, great stuff. All right. Two, two very simply, okay, now you have to get this third one right if you're going to join us in the VIP lounge. Are you ready? This okay, is it. Okay, here we go. This is it. All right. There are two co-founders of Wikipedia. Okay. Which one is more handsome. <laughs> Jimmy Wales. Jimmy Wales, is that right? I think it is. Congratulations, <laughs> Mohammed, you're joining us. <laughs> All right, back to you, Philomena. Thank you so much. A big round of applause for Mohammed and Casey. Casey, you're amazing. Thank you. Mohammed, I will see you backstage. Those were the easiest questions I've ever heard in my life. So congratulations. Okay, excellent. So, Lynn, you're going to know Lynn. He's going to scan the ticket. He's going to scan your badge. He's going to upgrade Mohammed and his friend. So I will see you guys backstage in a minute. Meanwhile, let's get back to business. Okay, you guys, listen up. We all know that ChatGPT has been shaking up an array of industries, that much we know, from search to copywriting and from coding to content creation. But the question is, will it transform every corner of the internet? So this is it for me. My name is Filmena Cautella. It was a pleasure to be here with you at Web Summit. For now, we're going to introduce Wikipedia founder Jimmy Wales, <laughs> expectedly the the cutest member from Wikipedia. And he's, gonna, he's here to explain why humanity will always need a trusted and reliable source of information, no matter how powerful artificial intelligence becomes. 
So please, let's give a big round of applause to Jimmy Wales and tonight's moderator, global technology correspondent at Axios, Ryan, Ryan Heath. Welcome and thank you. I will see you soon. Bye. Tough being next to someone so handsome, but I'll see how I manage. <laughs> Jimmy, when Wikipedia was first getting big, mm -hmm. it was subject to a lot of snobbery, a lot of scrutiny for error rates that were frankly a lot smaller than what ChatGPT has been producing this year. Mm. Why do you think that is? And are generative AI companies getting the scrutiny they deserve? So, I mean, I think w one of the things that we've seen over and over and over again is a new technology comes out and there's kind of a really easy, lazy alarmism that can happen. So I remember in the early days of eBay, it was like, oh no, somebody's selling a gun on eBay. Oh no, somebody's selling their baby on eBay. Uh, and then after a while, we sort of figured out, yeah, you can list whatever you want on eBay, but People will report it, it gets taken down. It's actually not that exciting. Nobody's actually sold their baby's soul on eBay. Um, and then, you know, there came a time then it was, it was Wikipedia. Um, that was the thing. I remember when Anna Nicole Smith died, who was a sort of a tabloid sensation, and somebody vandalized Wikipedia for just a minute or something and just blanked her page and wrote curse words or something. And I got eight calls from journalists saying, um, does this show a flaw in the Wikipedia model? And I'm like, I think there's a flaw in the media. Anna Nicole Smith dies and I get eight phone calls. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And so now, you know, when we look at, at the emergence of ChatGPT, clearly it's not good enough for a great many purposes. It's an amazing thing to play with and so forth, but when you really start to use it, what initially seems fantastic, you realize is, is pretty bad. Um, and I do think it's getting a lot of scrutiny. I mean, there's no one in this room who doesn't know a story or, or something about uh, ChatGPT. One of my favorite, by the way, is I love to ask uh, Wikipedia um, about my wife, um, Kate Garvey, who's not a famous person, but she's been in the media and, you know, she's... Uh, you can find out about Kate Garvey if you do I, a bit of Google searching. I could, yeah. She has a Wikipedia entry. Yeah, well, you don't need uh, to. Hopefully. But, but the, like, the fun a... thing is to ask, who did she marry? Mm -hmm. It's someone different every day. It's kind of amusing. Um, the less handsome co-founder of Wikipedia. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> and it's always vaguely plausible. Uh, you know, it's people who she's worked with in the past, sort of in yep. politics in the UK and so forth. And so that's the kind of thing that you get out of ChatGPT. You get plausible sounding nonsense far yep. too often. Uh, and that's gotten better with, with four. Yep. Um, and I think it will continue to get better. Uh, but, you know, I think we're still a long way from it being able to be a reliable source or, or to really... But one of the ways you got around here. that was mm. by having strong sourcing. Strong. Is that a solution for these language models to have I, citations or is it I something do, else? I do. I mean, I think that is, uh, is potentially incredibly important. Uh, I've been working with uh, Sacha Baron Cohen uh, on this idea he has of an AI for children, not necessarily children, teenagers, yep. that is really restricted in what it reads to quality sources. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that will work or not, but it's an interesting concept because for certain kinds of things, sort of reading all of Reddit and all of Twitter, it's really good in terms of learning how people actually speak casually and yep. so forth. But if you really want to get facts, it's, it's problematic. And actually one of the things an example that we see right now, and I think it's a risk to Google, uh, today, I just checked to make sure this is still true. If you type in, are there any countries in Africa that start with the letter K, the first quote that Google prominently features at the top is, no, there are none. The closest one is Kenya, but that starts with a K. And it's like, okay, that's nonsense, which Google has picked up mm -hmm. because it went viral. Lots of people linked to that page yeah. and so forth. It's sort of the natural consequence. Uh, but that sort of thing where, in this case, it's not that anybody's maliciously claiming nonsense, yeah. but it's the sort of thing that the Google algorithm can't quite recognize. ChatGPT got it wrong. Yeah. But any human would say, are you joking? Like, yeah. that's complete nonsense. But that's, that is just a literal demonstration of why you need humans in all of these loops. Uh, for sure, for sure. And I think it, it gets, there, there's a lot more subtlety. So if you ask ChatGPT questions about, um, 
someone who's really famous or some historical topic. It's actually much better. And that's where Wikipedia doesn't need help. Like, we've got tons of people who've written yep. about the you know, Battle of the Bulge in World War II or whatever. And when I first saw it, I got excited. I'm like, oh, maybe this is a tool we could use to write about slightly more obscure topics. But yep. as soon as you get very obscure at all, mm -hmm. it very confidently just makes stuff up. And that's really useless for us. Yeah, so, so this year we've had a lot of debate around are we getting close or will we get close to artificial general intelligence? But in a way, Wikipedia is a form of general intelligence because it is so crowdsourced. And the generative AI is still very narrow in what it can do. So I agree you've got the edge now, but, but how are you going to keep the edge when we get up to GPT-10 and 11 and 12? Well, I mean, I don't know what the future holds. I mean, I think that's, that's a big kind of existential question for humanity. I think we're still 20 or 30 years away from that. I think that some of the, the structural problems and the way that large language models work make it actually quite tricky to do the grounding, to do the sourcing. Yep. And it seems quite easy to us as humans because that we, were, well, we were taught it yep. as, by the way, not artificial journal intelligence, but actual mm -hmm. human intelligences. Yep. We were taught in in school, you know, when we were early teens, to like cite your sources and to think about what's quality and what's not, and don't repeat nonsense and so forth. And it's going to take a while uh, for for these models to get there. I mean, the, the the point about Wikipedia is it's not only do we have full general intelligence working on Wikipedia; it's not just one. Yep. It's tens of thousands uh, who have different experiences, different backgrounds, engage hopefully and usually in thoughtful discourse to try and figure out what's true. Um, and I think we're just a long way. I mean, I think just the, if, you, if you add up the computational power of all those brains, it still far outstrips yep. what, what any sort of big company can do with one uh, large language model. Yep. So the contributors are your unique asset mm. at the moment. Um, what motivates them? So I, I guess my real question is, how will you keep them motivated? And then separately, how can you imagine AI improving Wikipedia? Yeah, so on the first question, I mean, I, we just have fun. Like, the, the, y if you go on Wikipedia, you start editing, you meet other interesting people, particularly if you're into some fairly obscure niche topic, uh, you'll e meet other geeks who are, oh, wow, I didn't know there were 17 more people who are as obsessed with bridges as I am. And, and you meet them, and you've got that, that group. And so that has always been our goal and has always been fun. Um, I don't see people finding that not fun anymore, so I think that part's pretty easy. In terms of how we might use AI to help with the process of Wikipedia, I do think there's some really interesting ideas. Uh, just w one of the ideas that I've been playing with is, okay, here's a short entry in Wikipedia, and I can go and find 10 sources about that, and I can ask the AI to say, find me some statements that are in these 10 articles that should be in this Wikipedia entry but aren't. And I think it can do a pretty good job of that. And, and the truth is, if, if it's only 70% accurate, yep. that still may be enough of a productivity boost that I find it worth my while yep. to click on a button that says, what does the AI suggest? And then I go through and I go, oh, yeah, actually, that should be in there. Or the converse, which is actually probably more important, here's a biography. Find me any negative statements that aren't sourced. Uh, and that's like ding, 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 red flag yep. for us. And if we have the ability to do that with a model that runs over all of Wikipedia all the time looking for it, yep. then for the good volunteers who are trying to make sure that Wikipedia is not saying bad things about people, yep. um, they'll be able to more quickly go. Because sometimes you go to Wikipedia and you're like, oh, I want to work on a biography, but which yep. one? Where's the problem? You know? yep. So I think there's going to be some really interesting low-hanging fruit use cases where large language models could support the work of our community. And AI is really good at spotting patterns. So maybe it can spot gaps in Wikipedia, where I was reading about one amazing woman who wrote 1,600 Wikipedia pages of under-recognized female scientists. And yeah. maybe you're always going to need her to do that or yeah. other sort of committed volunteers. Yeah. But to spot the gaps, mm -hmm. that's something AI could help with. Uh, yeah, I mean, could definitely help with. I mean, often we already have a pretty good sense in the Wikipedia community where we're weak, where we're strong. Yeah. We try to address that, but it's not always easy because we don't have enough diversity in our community. We need more women editing. We need more people from all around the world editing to help us spot those problems because there's tons of like really interesting and important stuff that your typical tech geek 
man is not that interested in, and so therefore we, we're weak in those areas. And we think we can improve that. Now, thinking a bit about how generative AI has rolled out this year, or how, it, how the product's developed, um, a lot of these models have been scraping data from mm -hmm. all over the internet. You're a big chunk of the internet. How do you feel about Wikipedia data being used, or in some cases, misapplied into mm. these models, and you not getting a check for it? Yeah, I mean, for us, the, the whole philosophy of Wikipedia, we really come from the free software world, open source ethos. Everything in Wikipedia is freely licensed. You can copy it, modify it, redistribute modified versions, commercially or non-commercially. And we're really happy and proud, like, OK, if there are um, large language models, I'm pretty happy that they're reading Wikipedia and not just Elon Musk's Twitter. Um, that's not really a great source of truth. Um, I, I told him backstage, I, I will have one whack at Elon. It's always a crowd pleaser. Um, I, I wonder, what would Grok <laughs> say to that? Have, have you checked out Grok? The, the new service that Elon is providing. I haven't even you know. heard of it. So, okay. <laughs> well, there we go. That was a subtle. I haven't kept up with the news. So, uh, so uh, yeah. So basically, uh, we're 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 happy with all that. We would like to see attribution. Yep. Um, and then, obviously, if you're going to attribute to Wikipedia, you can't just make something up. Yep. And I've I've tried this. I say, you know, oh, where did you hear that Kate Garvey married? Um, Peter Mandelson. But what do you do? You and write said, them a letter? Or how do you hold them accountable for that? Um, I mean, we, we will see, right? I think as things emerge, I mean, I think at the moment, it's, you know, people understand that ChatGPT makes things up. I think it's really important that they understand that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when we have, you know, Google quotes us all the time and Google always links to us, you know, there's, there's best practices that are both. Yeah. Uh, part of our license, right, if you're reusing our content, but also just ethical, like, you know, plagiarizing yeah. is bad, but you also have to keep the lights on somehow. Like, I, I've received yeah. many Wikipedia yeah. fundraising yeah. messages. Wouldn't it be nice if OpenAI cut you a check? Well, I mean, this goes back to, I mean, we can step away from this licensing question. Um, like, we have a, an enterprise API feed because people who are using huge amounts of Wikipedia data like Google, they would like to have more of an industrial strength, so we, we're working with them to do that. And they pay us because it's a service we provide. But I don't think anybody really wants Wikipedia to be beholden to five big tech companies as our only sort of important customers. It's really, really important that Wikipedia is supported by the small donations by the general public. It keeps us accountable to the public. It keeps our community intellectually independent. Um, there's a lot of reasons why our existing model is quite healthy and quite good. And yeah, if the big companies can chip in some money too, that's good. But we want that to be in a balanced way so that we don't end up sort of as a, a captured uh, client. I mean, it's a, it's a problem, by the way, a lot of nonprofits have. If, you, if your source of funding is one big foundation or one big high net worth individual who loves your project, you could be at risk if they get bored of your project or they decide you're not doing a good enough job or your funding can evaporate overnight. Whereas we've got a huge base of donors, over five million people a year giving small amounts of money. Um, and that's just really important to, to keep Wikipedia healthy in all the ways that I think everybody wants us to be committed to neutrality, to quality, to thoughtfulness, and so forth. I wanted to tackle trust for a couple mm. of minutes. So people tell opinion pollsters all around the world again and again that they have a strong level of skepticism around AI in general. And maybe mm -hmm. some of that's a hangover from the social media and platform era and some broken promises there. Um, but I know that you're involved in something called Trust Cafe. Mm -hmm. So what, what does this AI generation of companies need to do do to rebuild trust so that we have a healthier ecosystem that we're all contributing to? Yeah, so I'm, I'm in the process of really working on a lot of ideas about trust. I'm writing a book about trust. Uh, I've got a project, trustcafe.io, which I've been kind of keeping under wraps, but it's open. Everybody go sign up, check it out. And the idea is to say, how can we build a new type of social media where the trusted people in the community who are trusted by the community actually have power? So it's yep. very much like that wiki model. In terms of the AI companies, the kinds of things that you have to do, that any company has to do, or any product has to do, 
it's pretty old fashioned, right? Um, certainly, I think OpenAI has been quite good about um, telling everybody, like, by the way, our product has some huge flaws and it makes stuff up. You know, that's not been a secret and they've not tried to bluster that it's better than it is and I think that's really important. Um, I think, you know, they are, uh, as far as I can tell, trying to be thoughtful about licensing content, whether that's needed or not, I don't know, but that, you know, that's an emerging area of copyright and all of that, very interesting. Um, but, I, you know, I do think it, it's very interesting because we're in this moment where um, it's suddenly a competitive product in the marketplace. And so Bing is using uh, ChatGBT, Google has Bard, I guess you're saying Elon's rolled out something I don't yep. didn't pay attention to. You've got a bunch to. of open source models. Um, you have you've got the open source model. Open you've got all models. this all this activity going on. Whereas I would say, if you rolled back five years, I was hearing from friends at Google like this is going to be amazing, yeah. but they were very very careful about yeah. what they released. And I think they were trying to be ethical and careful about it, and I think that was the right answer. But suddenly, once it's out there, uh, that doesn't mean people have carte blanche to be unethical, but it does mean they have to sort of move a little faster. You can't say, oh, we're going to think about this for 10 years. Uh, the competition is actually there and, and succeeding and so forth. Um, and, and so I think we will see a lot of fast, uh, fast improvements and a lot of problems will come from that. That's kind of a metaphor for maybe where humanity has been heading. We've all been speeding up in recent years. So maybe let's end on that philosophical note, thinking about future of knowledge and where you think that's all going to go. Mm. How do we as humans either specialize or keep our edge over AI, retaining mm. what makes us human, mm. but avoiding becoming redundant in the face of ever improving technology? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see that as a real risk right now. Like I said, when I started uh, this, this conversation, there's always sort of the easy, low-hanging alarmism, doomism, and so forth. When you actually use the tools, you're like, actually, it's pretty far from being good. Uh, it's super interesting. Um, and I think, you know, f for me, the future of knowledge is, is no different than it's ever been, right? Knowledge is um, recognition of facts of reality. And to get to knowledge, it takes serious effort and chewing and thoughtful addressing ideas, not falling for fallacies, not getting too emotional, being willing to challenge your assumptions, all of that good sort of epistemological thing that makes for great human flourishing and human life, same as it's ever been. Like, that's, that's never going to go out of style. Uh, you know, when we talk about post-truth politics or post-fact, I mean, everybody knows that's really, really bad. Right? We really want our politicians to tell the truth. Um, and we really want to live in a world where people can find some kind of shared understanding, even while acknowledging we're going to disagree on values and things like that. So I'm, I'm very old-fashioned about this sort of thing. It's just like, this isn't hard. You've got to work hard to get it right, and that's kind of the best you can do. And it's a big election year in 2024 around the world, so pay attention, folks. We don't want to mess this up. Supermodel and super founder Jimmy <laughs> Wales, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. I hope you all enjoyed our last two discussions. So for those of you who've been here before, you know what an incredible city Lisbon is. And for those of you who are here for the first time, I'm happy to tell you you're in for a remarkable treat. This will be our seventh year as Web Summit in Lisbon, missing only one year because of the pandemic. And we really consider Les Lisbon the home of Web Summit, and we appreciate how much Lisbon embraces us as the major annual event to happen in the city. So I want to recognize the support of the government of Portugal and the municipality of Lisbon tonight. 
which is why it is with great honor that I welcome our next guest to kick off Web Summit 2023. Please join me in welcoming the mayor of Lisbon, Carlos Moedas. Thank you. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to Lisbon. Welcome, my friends. It's such a great, great pleasure to be here tonight to welcome you to Lisbon, the city of dreams. Two years ago, I was here to tell you about my dream. And my dream was to make Lisbon the capital of innovation of Europe. That was my dream at the time, to really change the way you look at innovation. Innovation is not about a light bulb moment, it's not about an idea, it's about a process, it's about hard work, it's about getting up in the morning and trying to do it. It's really tough, it's a tough process, and that's what I wanted to do to create in Lisbon a unicorn factory. And that's what we did. We created in this city one of the major programs of scale-ups and innovation called the Unicorn Factory. And we did it thanks to you, because you were here to help me. Nobody believed at the time. The political pandit said, no, it's not going to happen. You're not going to attract anyone to Lisbon. And I said, yes, we're going to do this unicorn factory and we're going to attract good talent to Lisbon. And two years later, two years later, it happened. Today we have more than 54 companies, 54 tech companies that came to our country, to our city, and they come from 23 different countries, 23 different countries to create jobs in Lisbon. And of those, 12 are unicorns, 12 are part of the dream of becoming a unicorn. And those that came that are unicorns, they came also to create jobs, because you are the ones who create jobs, not the politicians, you are the ones who create the jobs and all those companies in Lisbon, and that's why I want to thank you. They announced more than 10,000 jobs in Lisbon. That's what it is. That's what you did. And that's why I'm so proud, so proud of having created this unicorn factory. But you know, today I come with another dream, another dream of mine. You know, uh, last week, I was inaugurating the offices, the offices of our 12th unicorn, a company from Denmark called Pleo. And the CRO, uh, an amazing man called Aaron Mani, uh, he was telling me, why Lisbon? And I said, why did you come to Lisbon? Is there any reason that you came to Lisbon? And he said, you know, because Lisbon is one of these cities, when you come from the very first moment, you feel that you belong. And when you belong, you become more creative. When you belong, you feel free. And I thought, this is the most interesting thing about my city, is that this city, historically, was exactly that. 1,200 years before Christ, when the Phoenicians created the city of Lisbon, they called it Alice Ubo, which in Phoenician meant safe harbor. Imagine that. Safe harbor because this was the city that for centuries people were together. People from different religions, Muslims, Jews, Christians, working together in diversity. And that was the big strength of our city. So today I want to announce a new project for Lisbon. We want to go from the unicorn factory to the safe harbor of innovation, to the place where you feel free, the place where everybody is what they are. The difference in Lisbon is that no one wants to change anyone. We welcome everyone, and everyone has the right to be what they want. That's the beauty of that. But there's one challenge to your generation. There's one challenge to your generation. If you want democracy, if you want a future for your children, you really have to focus technology in humanity. You really have to have a project to change for better democracy. And that means that all of you, with your companies, you have to work to solve the problems of today. And the problems of today are where do you do more housing for people that are poor, for people that cannot pay rent? What can you do about healthcare? What can you do about climate change? 
and I want you to come to Lisbon to help us to solve that, because that's the only way that you can contribute for the future of the world. If technology becomes something that helps humanity and democracy. So your responsibility from now on is that, is that you go from the innovation that you are used to be to the innovation that can help democracy to make it. So come to the safe harbor, Lisbon, come with your friends, put here your company and put it to the service of people. That's my dream about Lisbon. And as my dreams became true with you, I hope that this dream will also become true. Thank you so much to be in Lisbon. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for the energy you give me every time. See you next year. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but I am certainly feeling like there is no time to waste with that message. Um, now I want to introduce to you another incredibly important partner of Web Summit. I don't know if you know this, but the Minister of Economy here in Portugal is also the Minister of Maritime Affairs. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce an incredible supporter of the Portuguese startup economy, somebody who is passionate about what Web Summit means to Portugal and how all of Portugal can take part in what it means to be a technologist and an innovator and an entrepreneur, Antonio Costa Silva, Minister of Economy and Maritime Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to everybody. Welcome to Lisbon. Welcome to Portugal. Welcome to the Web Summit. Portugal is a very friendly country. We are one of the more safe countries in the world. So I think you feel at home in this city, in this country. And please enjoy the city, enjoy the Web Summit, enjoy our gastronomy, and enjoy also our wine. I know that there is a wine summit. Please don't spend much time on the wine summit than in the web summit. So keep a balance on that. When we look to the problems of our world today, and I think I have in front of me some, some of the most brilliant minds that we have across the globe, we need to solve these problems. And the problems can be solved only with innovation, with technology. And the Web Summit is a fantastic platform to connect people and ideas that are changing the world. And we need desperately these new ideas to solve the key issues of our time. So, in terms of these key issues, as you know, the most important of them is the climatic threat. We are an, under an existential threat with the deterioration of the climatic system of the Earth. We are losing at an amazing pace incredible masses of ice in both poles, northern and the southern pole. And ice is a stabilizer of the climatic system of the Earth. If we allow this to happen more and more, the warming of the oceans will be unavoidable because ice reflects part of the solar energy that reaches our planet. But the most critical issue is related to the northern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is covered 25% of the surface by the permafrost. The permafrost is a frozen soil that contains 1.5 trillion tons of organic carbon, twice the organic carbon that we have today in the atmosphere. If we allow the warming of these surfaces, we can be in a very difficult situation in the future. This is why the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, asked one once what is the purpose of the economy if we cannot brief. And to solve all these issues, it will be a key topic of the Web Summit, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence and the generative artificial intelligence with all the events in the last year, we know that can be a solution. The artificial intelligence will be the electricity 
of the 21st century, playing exactly the role that electricity played, changing and shaping functions, different seg segments of the economy. And if you can connect, connect the, all the developments in artificial intelligence with everything and the recent developments in quantum technology, everything related with advanced connectivity, with the, the trust architecture to preserve the safety and the digital identity of the digital systems, and also the industrialization of machine learning that is playing a huge role in the manufacturing. We can see the future to happen, and we have to make the future to happen. We have to contain the climatic threat, doing what we are doing in Portugal, changing our energy mix. We have a cluster of renewable energies that is more and more strong. 60% of the electricity that we use in this country comes today from renewables. And we will reach 80% in the next three, four years. We have also a change in terms of the paradigm of mobility. We need to change our cities. Cities cover 2% of the surface of our planet. More than 55% of the people live today in cities. They are responsible for 75% of the energy consumption. And they emit 80% of the CO2 emissions in our planet. If we are not able to change the paradigm of the cities, to build intelligent cities, we will have some difficulties in the future. So we we'll need new ideas, how to apply the Internet of the Things, how to apply the artificial intelligence to develop twin digitals of our cities in order to simulate all the flow of people, vehicles, energy, residuals, water, and have a key challenge in terms of the future. And if you look across the spectrum, in Portugal we are trying to develop also the circular economy. And why? Because we are a civilization that transforms resources into garbage in a velocity without parallel in history. There is a study by the US Geological Survey showing very clearly that in the last 60 years we are using, in terms, in percentual term, terms, 618 times more oil, 1,000 times more gas, 756 times more nickel. 1,500 times more bauxite. This is unsustainable. And when we look to the transformations in the world, we need to, deal, to do much more. And I think coming from you with your ideas, with your dreams, with the development of entrepreneurship, we can be in business. And don't be mistaken, we have a huge choice in, our, in front of us. We can either select a world like the Star Trek or a world like Matrix. These two extreme fictions can be used to illustrate the choice that remains in front of us. If we go to the Star Trek approach, the technologies will be used to fight the poverty, to fight inequality, to give unto the citizens, all the citizens, the opportunities of life and use technologies to find the environmental problems, to change the landscape of our planet, to build more sustainable civilizations, and in the end, use technology to generate a new wave of medicines and therapies to cure the diseases. But on the other side, we will have, we will have the system, the approach of metrics which means that we keep business as usual. The technologies are deployed, but they are not used in the right direction to fight poverty or inequality. The citizens will not be given opportunities. And the, the, the gains of these technologies will be appropriated by a few ones in detrimental of all society. This can happen. And as we know in the matrix approach, in the matrix model, there is Moebius the owner of the truth, the only owner of the truth. I don't like uh, unique owners of the truth. The truth is a collective approach built by everybody. And this is why in the Web Summit, the Web Summit is a huge platform of discussion, of challenging the obvious, of discussion of new ideas, a free debate. And freedom is the sense of life. Freedom is the genetic mark of the Web Summit. As, uh, the British writer A.G. Wells once said, human history 
is more and more, is becoming more and more a fight between education and catastrophic. And so, in front of these two models, we have to, uh, to develop a collective will to face the challenges and build a sort of Star Trek world for the future. This can be with the potential of the artificial intelligence. And the last studies say very clear that the artificial intelligence can add, in terms of the global economy, something like 16 trillion US dollars till the end of this decade. If we look to the world economies, the second largest economy, China, represents 18 trillion US dollars. So the potential of the artificial intelligence till the end of this decade is to add a new China to the world economy with all the unlocking potential for this technology, creating a new wave of prosperity for the nations and for the people. But this implies a collective choice for all of us. And as uh, the Irish philosopher and writer uh, Bertrand Russell once uh, said, what makes us wise is not the recollection of the past, but the responsibility for the future. And it is the responsibility for the future that is up to all of us. And I think with your ideas, with your dreams, and please don't give up your dreams, with the, the tackling of the, all these challenges that uh, lie ahead of us, we will solve this uh, problem that is pending up, up in our existence. I would like to finish saying to all of you that the Portuguese language is a wonderful language. And we have uh, writers, brilliant writers, if uh, you would like to learn, I encourage you to learn. One of these brilliant writers is the Mozambican writer Mia Couto. In one of his uh, novels, he said, life is too precious to be wasted in a disenchanted world. So it's up to all of us with new ideas, to the development of our dreams, to the development and transformation of our societies, to give again a sense to the world and a charm to the world. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the Web Summit. Thank you. Thank you. I so appreciate life is too precious to be wasted in a disenchanted world. That's, couldn't agree more. All right, so this year at Web Summit, we are very proud to announce that we have the highest number of startups that have ever attended in the history of the conference, more than 2,600 startups from over 160 countries. It's beyond our expectations. And in order to celebrate this, we wanted to highlight some of them as we do the official launch for Web Summit 2023. So please, I ask you to put your hands together to welcome some of our brightest and best, most amazing international startups here on stage. Congratulations. Great to have you. Thank you for being here. Oh, oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to meet you. Thank you for being here. Great to meet you. Congratulations. Wonderful to meet you. Thank you for being here. Hey! Are we ready to go? All right. Are you ready? Let's officially do this. Here. Mr. Minister, Mr. Mayor, will you join me? I'm going to ask you all, everyone out here in the audience, to help me count down so that we can officially launch Web Summit 2023. Are you ready? 
You're ready. Three, two, one, two. <laughs> night ends here, but as you know, the night summit is just about to begin. So go on, have an incredible time at the Hub Creativo Dobiato, and we'll see you back here tomorrow morning as we kick off day one of Web Summit 2023. Have a fantastic time, go enjoy Lisbon, make new friends, come back tomorrow, we'll see you soon. Of course, thank you for being here. I think we're bored. Bored of perfect, polished, pretty. I would much rather see chaotic energy. Great ideas can come from anywhere. I'm someone I never give up. Resilience is the word. What problems there are that you can solve yourself. We're developing not just the technology, but also the people around it and our organization and our understanding of how to